Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Leif. I'm a group leader at the VIH BIMSB in Berlin, and I will be moderating uh, our session today, uh, where we'll hear a talk from uh, Simone Picelli uh, from the Institute of Molecular and Clinical Ophthalmology in Basel. Um, but before that, we have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, we have um, Nina Cabezas Walscheid from the MPI from the Max Planck in Freiburg. Um, uh, giving us the honor in two weeks on November 4th. Um, so please come back uh, for that one. And then actually right after there is a single cell omics Germany workshop in Bonn um, with a focus on uh, clinical applications, right? And we have already, you can already see the speaker list. Uh, I think this is a great lineup. I think the, um, the registration deadline is open. Uh, yeah, as it says, uh, until October 28th. So if you can come to Bonn, uh, please check it out. Uh, it should be a very good meeting. And then some logistics about um, the format today, right? So we'll start with a talk from Simona, which will be about um, 30 minutes. If you already have questions along the way, you can um, type them in the chat and I can uh, read them out afterwards. But you're of course also very welcome to use the raise hand function and at the end of the talk, and uh, and then also ask your question directly to also make it uh, more interactive. And with that, um, I'm happy to introduce um, Simone here. Like I said, he is uh, joining us um, from Basel. There he is a team leader of the single cell genomics platform. And previously he had various stints. Uh, I think he did his PhD in Italy and then spent some, quite some time in Sweden uh, with intermittent stints in like Germany. Uh, but I think he's uh, well known for his uh, contributions to developing uh, smart sig 2 and uh, which is really a, one of the yeah a, a very popular single cell genomics essay um, that I guess a lot of you may have used in the past. And I guess now today he's going to bring us um, the next generation of that uh, flash seek. And without further ado, um, Simona, you're welcome to uh, share the screen. I think once Marco has it unshared. And, and take it away, the stage is yours. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yep, we see it. Perfect. Okay, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present uh, our latest work. Um, of course, I developed SmartSig2, so I continued along the same line of, uh, of research. Uh, and um, we developed uh, recently another full-length single-cell RNA sequencing method that we called FlashSig, just to differentiate it from uh, a jungle of SmartSig methods that are uh, there by now. Um, I will just give you a quick introduction, but probably many of you already know uh, the difference between uh, full-length uh, and, and three-prime methods. Uh, with the smart seek method, so we can characterize the entire transcript and, and therefore reconstruct uh, isoforms, uh, SNPs, uh, um, allelic variants, and transcriptional stat sites. And the disadvantage uh, of these methods is uh, that they, uh, they have a like, lower throughput compared to 10x, and the cost per cell is uh, higher. But the sensitivity is, of course, uh, much better than uh, um, three prime methods. Uh, just a second. Um, okay. Uh, SMART is an acronym that uh, stands for uh, switching mechanism at the five prime end of the RNA template and starts like uh, um, all the methods start with the sorting of single cells in, um, in plates containing um, a lysis buffer. So once the, the cell is uh, reaching the plate, uh, it's lysed, the mRNA is released, and it, it is made uh, accessible uh, for the reverse transcriptase that in the, in, in the um, RT mix that we uh, add uh, afterwards. We use an oligo DT primer carrying a, a known sequence at the five prime end. So the reverse transcriptase is generating a, a cDNA. And once it has reached the end of the um, mRNA molecule, uh, it's adding some untemplated nucleotides that are generally cytosines. And the RT mix, we also have a second oligo, which is called the template switching oligo, ending with the three uh, riboguanosine. 
and, and, and these riboguanosins are basically um, binding to the, the C tail and the reverse transcriptase is generating now a complementary copy of, uh, of the TSO. And in this way, we have uh, full length uh, cDNA molecules that carry known sequences at both ends. And we need to perform a PCR amplification to increase the um, amount of cDNA uh, um, because at, at this point is very, very little. <clears throat> but the, the fragments then need to be uh, fragmented to be suitable for Illumina sequencing. And we use a TM5 transposase and uh, perform a second PCR step so where we add uh, um, index adapters and uh, P5 and P7 sequences that are required for uh, Illumina sequencing. Um, we um, started developing FlashSeq by uh, basically um, trying to improve all the different uh, steps of this uh, classic SmartSeq method. We tested more than 150 reaction conditions, uh, uh, more than 100 were sequenced. And by now we have uh, sequenced more than 15,000 cells. Then um, we, we developed, uh, so we, we basically combined uh, uh, in RT and PCR in a single step. Uh, which makes the protocol shorter and much faster. But we also uh, tested uh, a lot of different uh, additives and enzymes. And we then uh, have uh, also replaced, of course, uh, uh, the, um, the old uh, reverse transcriptase in SMASIC2 with a, with a more efficient one. And we have also introduced unique molecular identifiers in the TSO. Uh, but also uh, redesigned the TSO sequence because we noticed some uh, artifacts in the existing uh, uh, TSO containing uh, um, UMIs. Um, the article has been uh, online since uh, end of May and uh, by now has already been um, accessed or downloaded more than 25,000 times and uh, already or about to be set up at, in several um, core facilities in Switzerland uh, and also abroad. Uh, we actually flash seek is a, is a, um, uh, comes in three different variants or flavors uh, to meet different uh, user needs. We have a standard protocol which is the the most similar to Smart Seek Two, and it's a good choice for uh, um, an initial study of differential gene expression expression. But of course, the sensitivity is better than smart 2 Then we developed a, a fast protocol, which we call the low amplification protocol, as the same uh, uh, sensitivity as the standard one, but it can be performed in a, a much shorter time. And we also um, introduced, as I said, uh, uh, UMIs in the, in the TSO to, to make uh, um, possible the um, bioinformatica uh, isoform reconstruction of the transcripts and this method is the most uh, is very close to to smartsic3 so the standard protocol and also all the other uh, all the three are uh, available already on, on protocols io and there uh, you can find all the details and tricks and tips uh, for performing the uh, experiment um flash seek uh, in uh, this is the basic version is uh, much faster than SmartSeq2 and SmartSeq3. And as, as I already mentioned before, that is due uh, to the um, shorter RT and also by combining uh, RT and PCR in a, in a single step, in, in, in a single mix. Um, we initially performed some uh, uh, tests to um, um, assess the sensitivity of the method and uh, the initial reactions were done in 25 microliters and 96 well plates so it's a very large volume but even in that large volume we could uh, see that the number of detected genes uh, was uh, higher uh, compared to SmartSeq2 and SmartSeq3 in HEC293 cells. Um, we then uh, miniaturized the reaction, so we scale it down to five microliters, which uh, 
here, sorry, you don't see very well, but it's called miniaturized, but it's actually our standard volume now. And we can see that uh, at uh, uh, regardless of sequencing depth, the sensitivity uh, of flash seek uh, is uh, is higher than the um, old versions of of the, of the protocol, and also the number of uh, isoforms that we can detect uh, is uh, is higher than SMASC two and SMASC three. Uh, the gene body coverage is very similar to what you already know from from SMARC2, uh, but the cell to cell correlation is uh, is higher. Uh, we then compare the performance uh, uh, of the of the methods uh, in the standard twenty five microliter volume, five microliter, two point five, actually even one point twenty five, and there was no loss in sensitivity. Uh, confirming that uh, the the protocol can uh, uh, can be scaled down, uh, uh, yeah, uh, without uh, basically any issue. Um, we then uh, move to a more complex sample uh, using um, PBMCs, and uh, here we have a UMAP uh, uh, where on this uh, small uh, small box. Uh, we uh, the cells are colored by by method, and you see that there is a like good overlap, confirming that uh, the re volume reduction doesn't introduce introduce many biases. And here they are colored by cell types, uh, cell type, and we can see that we uh, can reconstruct, we can detect the uh, the major uh, cell subpopulation. Uh, interesting, interestingly. Um, uh, the uh, for both cell types, uh, the um, percentage of read uh, mapping to exons was uh, very high for uh, flash seq and smart seq two. Um, was a bit lower for smart seq three in in our hands. So we we noticed that there is an increase in uh, uh, the number of intronic reads uh, in smart seq three, while uh, uh, in in our case this. Uh, uh, the, the percentage of reads mapping to introns is, uh, was uh, lower. Um, I said that the volume reduction didn't uh, uh, make things uh, worse or better, but actually it's not true. For some, uh, for some cell types like CD14 positive uh, monocytes or CD16 positive monocytes or CD8 and naive T cells, we had actually an improve in the in the number of detected genes, and uh, we think that is probably due to the fact that the lower volume is known to in generally increase the efficiency. Maybe when the RNA content is very low, uh, the reaction works better uh, in in a smaller volume. So to conclude this first part, we um, have developed. Um, improved, let's say, SMRC2 method that we call the flash seek uh, that can be miniaturized and automated. Uh, we are automating it in the lab with the T confluent robot and the IDOT and relies uh, also on off-the-shelf reagents like SMRC2. And though we capture not only more genes, but also a more diverse uh, a set of isoforms. Uh, we can miniaturize it, and uh, in some cases, uh, this leads to a better sensitivity. And uh, miniaturization and autom automation are reducing the end some time uh, to less than one hour, and the cost per cell is uh, one dollar uh, or one euro or, or less. The second protocol is called the low amplification. Um, the 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 protocol starts uh, like uh, for the standard flash seek with uh, by sorting uh, uh, single cells in plates. We then perform uh, RT and uh, and the shorter PCR. So instead of doing uh, twenty cycles of PCR, we generally do 10, 12, 16. Uh, depends on the on the cell type. Um, we then uh, skip the, the cleanup, the QC, uh, sample normalization, and we just take a, um, an aliquot of this RT-PCR product uh, and we transfer it to a new plate uh, and, and perform a dilution and um, tagmentation and then, and then PCR like uh, in, a, in a standard protocol. Uh, and this allows us to, to cut the processing time from seven hours to four and a half hours. 
So the rationale behind uh, this low amplification protocol is that uh, uh, when we, we do uh, 20 cycles of PCR, we generate nanograms of cDNA. Actually, with the flash seq we generate sometimes up to eight times more cDNA compared to uh, smart 2 or smart 3 But we need uh, just a few hundred picograms for library preparation uh, because the TM5 is, of course, very efficient. Um, so this uh, uh, unnecessary extra amplification uh, is a uh, cost time and also introduces bias because it can distort uh, the real gene expression and rare transcripts uh, or long transcripts can be lost. And uh, reducing the PCR amplification, uh, of course, uh, uh, as a downside, uh, we, we cannot uh, perform an intermediate QC because there is too little cDNA and we won't be able to, to see it on the bioanalyzer. And, and if we would perform a cleanup, we would risk to, to lose the, the very little cDNA that we have there. Therefore, we need to, to skip it. On the other hand, uh, in, the, in the PCR mix, uh, there are a lot of salts and residual primers and additives, and therefore we need to dilute the, mm, this solution to allow the TM5 to, to work. We have tested a different number of pre-amplification cycles, and uh, we, perhaps unsurprisingly, we uh, found that uh, the number of cycles uh, are depending on the initial uh, RNA content of the cell, which is, of course, different from cell to cell. Um, we have also tested a different number of uh, uh, post tagmentation PCR cycles. We have titrated the amount of TN5, and we have used two different cell types as a model. Again, HEC293 cells and PBMCs. And then in the paper, in the supplementary um, data, we, we give guidelines to, to the users um, who want to, to test this protocol. We have seen that for, uh, for cell lines or for cells containing a lot of RNA, 10 to 12 cycles of PCR are, are sufficient. And for smaller cells like PBMCs, 14 to 16 cycles uh, are, are necessary. Um, uh, the coverage, the, the gene body coverage uh, was, uh, was very similar uh, for all these experiments, regardless of the number of PCR cycles that we used uh, in, the, in the first PCR. Uh, if it was eight or if it was 19, there was no major difference. Um, but interestingly, when we go below eight cycles, so we start uh, seeing uh, um, a drop uh, of, uh, of genes that, that are uh, uh, detected by um, less than one read. So these, uh, um, these actually are and probably not genes, uh, re real genes, but are just uh, single intronic reads. Uh, and I will uh, explain you later what, we, what our, our hypothesis is in, in this case. Um, and also here we see that by reducing the number of PCR cycles, the, the number of uh, uniquely mapped reads uh, is, uh, is decreasing, while the um, percentage of uh, multi-mapping or unmapping reads is, uh, is increasing. And for both cell types, uh, also the, the reads mapping to, uh, to exons uh, is uh, um, going down uh, around the, when we perform less than eight cycles. So the, the idea uh, here, or the, what we have, uh, our hypothesis, that which is also uh, being confirmed by all the tests that we did, is that uh, uh, there is a, a, a balance that needs to be found uh, between uh, amplifying the cDNA enough to have uh, uh, enough sufficient material for tagmentation and tagmenting the um, the genomic DNA that is still present in the in the well, um, because we have lysed the the cell, most likely we have also lysed the the, the nucleus, um, and therefore the GDNA, uh, the genomic DNA has been made accessible. It is double stranded and can also be used as sub substrate for the TM5. And we can also, uh, when we look, for example, at uh, centromeric regions, which uh, should not express any gene, we see that when we perform a standard flash seek with 19 cycles, 
this in case th this experiment was done in HEC 293 cells, but for PBMCs uh, is, is the same. We we don't see any uh, we don't see any any reads. But when we uh, decrease the number of PCR cycles, we start seeing uh, this uh, this background. And when we looked uh, more closely, we see that there are a lot of uh, uh, reads that are actually um, spread uh, all across this uh, uh, gene desert, and which indicate that it's uh, most likely genomic DNA fragmentation. Um, therefore, performing enough PCR cycles uh, uh, means to increase the proportion of cDNA that we have in the in the well and minimize the, the contribution of the genomic DNA. We um, did uh, the, the same experiment with, uh, also with the PBMCs, and uh, we see that uh, even with the low amplification protocol, we can detect the major uh, population, and that the, um, the bias introduced by this uh, reduced amplification uh, is, uh, is not, not important compared to the standard, uh, to the standard protocol. Uh, interestingly, uh, to uh, um, uh, stress again the, how sensitive FlashSeq is, uh, we um, were able to um, reproducibly assign the cell type labels to more than 90% of the cells with just uh, 5,000 reads. So the conclusion for, for this part is that we uh, have developed a much shorter protocol uh, that can be performed in four and a half hours from uh, fax uh, sorting to uh, sequencing ready libraries, which uh, theoretically can also, also means that we could perform two rounds of library preparation in a single day. And we have achieved that by remo uh, removing uh, cleanups, uh, QC, and uh, sample normalization steps, which also means that we are using less plasticware, less tips, less reagents, and lowering the, the cost per cell. Of course, uh, for every cell type, we need to find the, the right balance between uh, too much or too little PCR, but we provide uh, uh, guidelines and uh, it shouldn't be difficult to, uh, to adapt the, them to, to the cell type that will, a user is, uh, is dealing with. Uh, maybe the low amplification protocol is not the, the go-to protocol for a, um, the standard experiment when the users have only just one plate, but could be an interesting uh, choice when many plates need to be processed in parallel, for example, in a, in a core facility setting. And the last protocol I, that I want to, to talk about is the FlashSeq um, um, UMI. Uh, where we um, modify the, the template switching oligo uh, um, and introduce uh, unique molecular identifiers. So the, um, the UMIs in a full-length uh, uh, RNA sequencing protocol uh, has, uh, have been introduced by SMARSIC3 a couple of years ago. And uh, the, the idea is, uh, is very interesting. So we perform RT um, with um, uh, MPCR, like in a standard protocol. And then we generate full length uh, molecules carrying a UMI at one end. And then by performing a limited fragmentation, we generate a longer, uh, longer than usual reads and uh, two types uh, of reads. So the, the terminal reads that uh, uh, have a, a UMI uh, and the internal reads without a UMI. So by performing paired and sequencing, we can then uh, uh, couple the UMI to a downstream uh, exon or a portion of an exon, and therefore bioinformatically reconstruct, uh, at least in part, uh, uh, gene isoforms. Um, I showed you before how the template switching uh, reaction should work. The TSO should anneal only when the um, RT is completed uh, and, the, and the cytosines have been added at the end. However, there is a, uh, it's, already, it's known uh, since many years that uh, the TSO is prone to uh, give a strand invasion. And strand invasion is uh, facilitated by um, the presence of UMI, which is a random sequence. And of course, also by the uh, uh, three ribo G 
because ribon nucleotides are, let's say, stickier than, uh, than nucleotides, so they can anneal uh, much easier to the cDNA or the RNA. And this happens when, um, uh, by chance, uh, in, the, in the cDNA that has been generated, there is a, a, a perfect match uh, um, of the UMI and the, and the three ribog. This can be in the same orientation uh, or in uh, uh, opposite orientation, can be a partial annealing, so like a partial match or, uh, or a full match. And the TSO can also bind uh, uh, the, the mRNA. And this is a problem because uh, it can uh, create uh, false isoforms and it can of course bias uh, molecule counts. And the, the solution, uh, which we didn't, uh, we didn't invent anything, but we just uh, looked in the literature and it, has already, it had already been proposed by uh, Piero Carnici 10 years ago and is used in every 10X kit, um, is to introduce a spacer between uh, uh, the UMI and the RIBOG. So we tested many different spacers of, di of different lengths and uh, eventually we set on a five base pair spacer. And in this way, we were able to reduce the um, percentage of uh, reads generated by this strand invasion phenomenon from 5% or even in some cases 10% uh, observed in the smart 6 3 to less than 0.1%. Um, we then tested our protocol against the, the smart 6 3 uh, the published data, but also data that we generated in the lab. And we um, observed that uh, FlashSeq UMI can detect more genes than SmartSeq3, both when using uh, internal reads only or uh, both internal and UMI reads. We detect on average 8% more genes and 18% more uh, isoforms. And here is, a, is an example of all Oh, not actually not all, but some of the template switching oligo with different uh, spacer sequence, uh, sequences coupled to different oligo DT, uh, which uh, we also tested. And yeah, and here is basically the, the spacer that in the, in the end we had the, the best performance, uh, which uh, turned out to be the one that had the least match to the uh, transcriptome and, and the genome. We then benchmarked uh, our protocol uh, using uh, a more complex uh, or interesting biological model, uh, human retinal organoids, uh, which are uh, a retina in, uh, that is growing in, in a Petri dish. Um, we took a week uh, 18 retinal organoids and dissociated um, and then split the cell suspension in two and performed uh, um, a standard uh, 10x uh, 3 prime RNA sequencing experiment and, and flash seek. Uh, unsurprisingly, we could uh, detect the same cell types for both methods. Um, the advantage of the 10x data uh, is that in this case, we, we could, uh, due to the higher number of cells, we could better reconstruct uh, cell fate progression. Uh, but the advantage of, uh, of uh, FlashSeq UMI data was that we had a higher information uh, um, per cell uh, due to the um, higher sensitivity which uh, simplify the annotation uh, of, uh, of, the, of some cell types. Um, also from, from this dot plot, uh, it's clear that the, the, the marker expression is, is very similar for, for both methods. And uh, interestingly, uh, the, the number of genes that we can detect uh, uh, with uh, FlashSeq is uh, two times higher compared to 10x. And this is regardless of, uh, of a read type, if we use only UMI reads or, uh, or internal reads. And also the gene diversity is higher, uh, even after downsampling for the, uh, the flash seq data to the average uh, uh, 10x uh, reads, which of, of course, so when we do full length sequencing, we are sequencing much deeper than 10x. Um, an example of how we, can use uh, uh, full length uh, data uh, and what are the advantages are compared to three prime. Um, it's, uh, it's uh, just one example. We, we give a few in the paper is that we can distinguish between uh, 
of course, the different uh, isoforms. And here is uh, an example of the pyruvate kinase, uh, and which uh, is known to have two isoforms, uh, one uh, containing uh, exon 9 and one where the exon 9 is skipped and uh, uh, exon uh, 10 is present uh, instead. And different cell types uh, in, the, in the organoids are uh, expressing uh, uh, different isoforms. And um, mm, for example, uh, um, amacrine cells or bipolar or horizontal cells uh, are expressing uh, uh, mostly um, um, uh, this, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, are expressing mostly um, uh, PKM1 and um, and uh, while rods that have a uh, higher metabolism and uh, they they need more energy they are expressing uh, mostly PKM2 and this has, has already been uh, shown in in mouse uh, experiments uh, what we observed here um, is that uh, also Müller glia cells uh, in the in the organoids uh, are expressing PKM2, and this, for example, had not been observed before uh, in uh, in organoids. So, in conclusion, uh, we show that it's also possible to uh, introduce uh, uh, UMI in the in the flash seq protocol without. Uh, any any loss in um, uh, sensitivity, and we have also changed the, the sequence to try to address some issues uh, uh, that uh, had been observed by using the uh, SmartSeq 3 TSO, and we uh, also of course uh, um, show that um, the sensitivity of the plate-based method is uh, is higher than uh, when doing uh, 10x. So the overall overall conclusion of uh, uh, of, of this uh, um, presentation is that we have a, um, a new protocol uh, that is called FlashSeq, which shows uh, um, the excellent gene detection can be performed in seven hours or uh, uh, four and a half hours if uh, if we choose the low amplification protocol, which is uh, probably the fastest uh, single cell plate based single cell protocol ever developed so far and um, we can introduce umi and all the three uh, variants are uh, um, can be automated can be miniaturized uh, and therefore uh, uh, decreasing the the cost of uh, of the reaction and we have also now a fully automated uh, FlashSeq uh, workflow available. Uh, we have an application note that we wrote uh, together with the Cytina and the Spendix and will be published in a couple of weeks where we um, perform the single cell sorting with their f site instrument in using 384 well plates. All the dispensing steps were done with the IDOT. All the cleanup steps were done with the CWASH. So that makes the protocol almost entirely tipless and um, significantly lower the initial investment required for uh, performing this kind of experiment because the cost of the three instruments is uh, lower than uh, uh, compared to the fax plus a standard liquid handling robot. And this allows also further miniaturization uh, compared to what I have shown here. And uh, we have validated this uh, in week 22 human retinal organoids. We could again uh, see the, the major populations uh, that uh, we, we expected. And what is interesting uh, is that uh, with the F site omics, uh, we can really image the, um, the cells and uh, we can measure different parameters like fluorescence, size, roundness. And can we then make statistics uh, out of it and uh, correlate these measurements with uh, cDNA content or with the uh, number of genes? Uh, what is next? So we are not probably going to develop uh, another plate-based FlashSeq version 2 because we, after the paper, we tried to uh, improve it even further, but we didn't uh, succeed so far. But we are now setting it up on a microfluidic device uh, 
first tests are, are promising, but the reaction is still very inefficient. Uh, and uh, our idea is to make uh, a tunable protocol where we can uh, uh, run uh, small scale or large scale experiments, uh, depending on the needs, and, and therefore uh, decreasing the reagent cost, but also the cost uh, associated with, um, with the um, instrument. And, and the idea would be to, to make a library that can be sequenced directly on a, on a long sequencing uh, platform like uh, Oxford Nanopore or PacBio, or uh, also um, suitable for, uh, yeah, for Illumina by, by performing a, a fragmentation. And with this, I want to uh, acknowledge all the people who did uh, the work, and especially Vincent in my group, and our collaborators at Novartis and SQL. And one last thing, we are looking for a, a wet lab and bioinformatics scientists. So if you are interested, just uh, just drop me a mail. And then with that, I am done. Thank you so much, uh, Simona, for this wonderful talk. Um, sure, there are some questions. Some questions already reached me in the chat. Um, so there's one question um, by Peter who is asking for your microfluidic setup, uh, what is the maximum size of cells that can pass through the channels? Sorry, what, what is it? Uh, what's the maximum size of cells that can pass through the channels? Um, we have done uh, only tests with the uh, hex cells at the moment. And uh, and uh, some organoid cells, but uh, uh, I I don't know exactly. I th I think they they don't recommend bigger than thirty cells, uh, thirty microns. Sorry. I mean the the but we didn't test uh, more than I mean we did extensive tests with hex cells only, and that is not a problem. So the, the limitation sounds similar, or the potential limitation sounds similar to what is, I think, common now for 10x, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And unless you know how to build your own microfluidics device with uh, no, we. I mean, I didn't want to. We 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 are collaborating with a company. We are not building our our device, but it's uh, yeah. okay. it's another it's another principle, and we. I mean, I, it's just that uh, I cannot give you more uh, info now, but. Fair enough. Um, there's another question. Have you compared FlashSeq to a commercial five prime assay? No, we didn't. Uh, we just uh, we just took what was available in the lab. So we are generally routinely running the the three prime end uh, protocol, but we, we are not using the five prime. Uh, I mean. To, to, to be fair, we, we were asked uh, uh, by the reviewer to compare it, uh, to benchmark it against uh, SmartC3. Unfortunately, in our hands, it didn't uh, work very well. So we had to, to switch to, to 10X um, because we didn't want to, yeah. I mean, we, we thought, okay, we are not really the, the authors of SmartC3, so maybe we are doing something wrong and, uh, and yeah, so that's 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 why we just yeah. see what was available. Yeah, maybe I mean I'm not sure. I mean maybe the question is also targeted at like T cell receptor sequencing, which I guess is typically done via five prime assay. So have you have you tried that? We did uh, uh yes, we did a TCR analysis uh, on on our data, but we didn't benchmark it against the the ten x. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, but in principle, reconstruction seems possible, which yes. would also be kind of expected, I guess, yeah. given the estimate, right? Yeah, um, I mean, then the, also the, the, we, we detect, uh, we, we can also see that we detect more full length or uh, at least the average size of the, of the cDNA is, is longer than with SMART-C2. We therefore assume that we have a, a better representation of, uh, um, of, of the five prime of or more uh, uh, full length transcripts. Okay, and maybe along these lines, have you tried uh, any form of uh, mutation calling, right? Because I think there might be people in the community who are interested in, let's say, cancer samples, calling somatic mutations. 
I mean, in principle, you would expect it will probably also work better, but I mean, maybe you have a, can give them a sense of, you know, how well it performs. Um, yeah, so we we call the SNPs uh, in the, and then we, ha we have a, uh, described that in the paper. The problem is that you need uh, some sort of grind, grind, uh, ground truth and therefore, we need to do the, the uh, exome sequencing, and we we have done it only for uh, uh, some samples that uh, we we just use some samples that had already been sequenced, and uh, but not not more than that. Uh, but we 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 show that we can uh, we can detect. Uh, I mean, there is there are also a lot of false positives, eh? so it's uh, it's also a balance between. Uh, uh, what is a true SNP and uh, what is not, but yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, wow, well, I guess I'm getting more and more questions here. Um, Stein is asking the microphilic setup uh, droplet based like 10x, like is a droplet based like 10x or is it micro well based technique? No, it's a micro, it's a microfluidic based, yeah. I guess my fake base, okay. Then we have a question. Have you tested other kits or enzymes than the Illumina kit for tagmentation? Yes. So we did, uh, we do tagmentation. So for the UMI protocol, we want to have uh, um, something that is uh, um, stable and, and robust. So we generally use the Nextera kit. For all the other experiments, we use our own TM5. Uh, but we also tested the, the Plexwell uh, um, kit from Sequel, and we actually have an application note that we wrote with them where we uh, benchmarked the single cell kit uh, against the SmartSig2, SmartSig3, and the Takara Smarter kit version 4. No, sorry, the single cell kit uh, from Takara. And, uh, and that is also, a, it's also TM5 based. Um, yeah, I mean, they are all TM5 based, but they are different uh, kits. Yeah. Um, there's one question. Is FlashSeq optimized to avoid chimeric cDNA produced during amplification that can be seen using long reads? Mm, I guess that we have, uh, I mean, we cannot, uh, we see that the strand invasion is reduced, but uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't check. Uh, yeah, no, we, I mean, the idea is to, if we, we to develop uh, the a protocol that, uh, that we will uh, then uh, run directly on, uh, on the Nanopore platform, but we haven't done it yet. So I, fortunately, I don't have uh, a number to say what is the percentage of uh, chimeric transcripts. Fair, fair enough. Um, I guess you can also use FlashSeq for like small bulk samples, right? Yes, that we we do it. We did it already with SmartSig too. You can uh, yeah. you can run it uh, on on ten hundred cells. Of course, when the number of cells goes uh, above a certain level, I have no idea, like thousand or something, then you need some uh, adjustment, mostly in the oligos and amount of oligos and the amount of DNTPs, but it can be run on bulk. Yes. Okay. And then maybe last question, unless another one pops up, uh, which is if you use 10x for a cell number that is similar to FlashSeq standards, for example, 500 cells, does FlashSeq still give better results, like content per cell compared to 10x? Yes, I think that the problem with 10x is that uh, the reaction is, uh, I don't know, it seems to me that the, the chemistry is, is really good. Um, I mean, we we have tried, of course, to to replace all the reagents in the 10x kit. We we come to to something, but it's not even close to to the performance of 10x. But still, the reaction is not as if the RT is not as efficient as uh, if it is done in plates, and that is we we see it all the time. Okay, and then okay, now this is the last question. Now I think um, great techniques. I would have two questions. Okay, so there are two last questions. Uh, one, is there a limitation on the maximum size of the transcripts that can be detected? 
So that's question one, maybe answer that first, and then we'll go to the question two. Unfortunately, it depends on the enzymes, and we have uh, we are all using the same bad enzymes that they were developed uh, 30 years ago. Uh, so there is a limitation how efficient is the, the reverse transcriptase and how far it can go be before it stops or, or, or drops off. Uh, they are, and they, yeah, cannot continue. So yeah, we can detect uh, on average now like 2, 2.2 kb. Maybe we can go up to 3 kb for some transcripts, but not longer than that. Okay. So I guess we need new enzymes before we see flash seq version two, right? Um, there are new enzymes there. They are not working in single cell. I see. There are these uh, okay. group two reverse uh, transcriptases. They can go up to five, six kb. We have we have tested them. They are they work very well, but they have uh, like a, a lot of issues, and, mm, I see. and they don't have the required sensitivity. Yeah. And then okay, final question: Is it possible to use UMIs with the low amplification protocol? It is possible. You just to make your life much uh, <laughs> more difficult. <laughs> uh, the problem is that what we couldn't explain, but we we see it uh, uh, in every experiment, is that uh, um, the the cDNA yield for uh, the UMI protocol is lower than compared to the standard protocol. And then I don't know if it is due to the fact that we are not doing a SMI suppressive PCR like in the standard flash seq or smart seq 2 but this is already giving less cDNA and the, and the low amplification gives, uh, of course, you want to have less cDNA, so you need to really do an additional titration probably. Uh, that's why we didn't combine the two. It was uh, a bit too complicated. Okay. Well, lots of nuances. Um, thank you so much, Simona, for your time. I mean, if other questions come up, I'm, sh I'm sure uh, Simona will be happy to be contacted also yeah, about his, op uh, his job openings, of course. Um, so with that, um, I thank everybody for your time and hope to see you again in two weeks. Uh, when Nina is here. And um, until then, have a great weekend and uh, good luck with your research, everybody. Thank you. Bye.